Welcome back to Gardening with Ryan. Today's going to be another theological ramble, and... Well, I was having a hard time uh, deciding on the topic, so eventually deciding on the topic just turned into an internal theological dialogue that I'm about to externalize, sort of picking up on the last one. So, the Christian today finds themselves in a situation where, okay, they want to become a Christian, and they are presented with a scheme of denominational models and people willing to fight for them. And, oh, look how, look at that plant, look how that's sticking up now, look how healthy that looks, and how much that one's grown. But, anyway. And the convert is expected to discern who has theology figured out just right, who has their categories right. Um, I was having a discussion with a friend, and I want you guys to do something. I want you guys to go on Google, or your search engine of choice, go to the images search. Oh, look at that big piece of grass growing up there. Nice. But search Ordo Salutis chart. Ordo Salutis chart. And then... I want to ask you the question. Does salvation hang on the hinge of these being in the right order? Or is it fine as long as you don't place justification and sanctification in the same category, but you're allowed to differ on other things. Whereas, just an open question, sort of. Now, lest I appear like I'm coming off with saying that differences are completely unimportant and meaningless. That's not at all what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is that when you have many traditions claiming mutual exclusivity and a right to Christianity, and the consequence of being in the wrong camp is um, an eternal fire bath, and when we gauge most people's uh, standing with God by giving them a theology quiz, there's probably something wrong. And have you ever noticed that for pretty much everybody these days, the standard just changes the more you know? If a layperson was completely unable to articulate forensic justification versus ontological infusion of grace. But they were just like an old grandma that talked about trusting Jesus. Would you ever say this? Uh, uh, you unsaved heathen? No. But as soon as somebody is on the internet and likely through no choice of their own is thrown into a world of theological vocabulary and is forced to take a position to be a real Christian, then as soon as they say something that's slightly out of line with orthodoxy as is perceived, oh, you reprobate. If only you would have known what sort of torment you were about to secure for yourself. So, you know what I think would be a great idea?
for all the scrupulous people in the world and for the sake of just getting things figured out. Some ecumenism. And by ecumenism, I don't mean compromise. Get some people from every denomination together, even if they think that they are unsaved reprobates to each other, and let them express that. But get together and force everyone <laughs> to lay out exactly here's how it is that you do not burn forever. Here's how you do. And if you can't define those categories, you're not allowed to come to the club anymore. Right? And from there, I feel like we have something to work with. Oh look, a lizard on the tree. Kind of, I can't even tell what kind of lizard that is. Nor can I locate it anymore. Maybe you guys can see it. Oh well. I think it's gone. I would be too if I was the lizard and there was water flying everywhere. But my thesis is essentially salvation is not by being a dweeb. Or at least I hope not. But I got driven to the point where I asked how much systematic theology must I learn to be saved? And I feel like a lot of my fellow denomination hoppers have had the same kind of thought. So... Maybe it's time that we demand from Professor Fatbottom at the seminary just just lay it out for us how to not burn forever, bro. How many denomination hoppers do you think are maliciously just like going around trying to like destroy traditions? I mean they exist. I have encountered them. <laughs> well, one. <laughs> But it's not very common, I don't think. And anyway, does here's a question. This might seem a little bit silly at first, but but, but, but hear me out here. Hear me out. Does anyone? Do, do you believe we'll be sinning in heaven? Does anyone? Do you need to be made from somebody who sins into somebody who doesn't sin? Yeah. Okay, so everyone's agreeing on that, just just not when it happens. Some people say it doesn't happen now, it happens when you die, it happens later. But Maybe the reason a lot of these discussions were not relevant to early church discussions of orthodoxy and heresy and lines, because they don't matter. Like, I don't, I don't know if that's the case. It's just, it's just a conjecture, but maybe they don't really matter. And the, I don't remember who I'm quoting or if, if my friend that I think I'm quoting is quoting somebody here. So I don't want to make any attributions here, but the quote that I'm thinking of is, um, uh, how did it go? The New Testament doesn't seem to focus much on the application of redemption, just the fact that it's there. Maybe the means of application is not... Well, I'm not going to say it's not important, but...
I guess, in, uh, if you, according to most standard Protestant and Eastern Orthodox and Roman models, the saved person is somebody who strives to obey God's commandments, grows in holiness in this life, and is forgiven by the blood of Christ. And they would all agree to that. And of course, you can start parsing that and what it means. And I'm not saying the distinctions aren't important. I'm just saying that maybe, just maybe, this is in the realm of in-house discussion, even so much so that there's not a need for a break in communion. I don't know. folks I do not know these are all just questions I don't claim to have the answers one thing that's interesting. It's interesting how change can happen. I've worked at the same job for like five years and I quit and people were just shocked. They're like, hey, you not working there? That's insane. I, that's almost inconceivable. But I never thought that me not working there would come in this form. But it's a good one. Yeah, things are going okay. So. Yeah, I start my new job tomorrow. So. That's encouraging. Please pray for me on that. And, you know, a lot of people on this channel really like to watch me sleep. And... Like, I really hope it's not for anything sexual. If it is, let me know so I can take it down. Actually, no one's going to take me up on that. Well, okay, there might be people that know. I, I, I don't know. I, okay, I guess I sort of understand the appeal. In that if you lonely, and I'll admit I'm lonely. Um, I, I, like, I, I can understand from the perspective of a fellow lonely person why it might be comforting. But I hope it's not, like, some weird fetish thing, man. If it is, I just want you to know viewer. I'm not cool with it. <laughs> but if you just like watching me sleep, that's fine. There's a big bug in there. Is that a beetle? Or a bumblebee?
I like bugs. Nope. I think we pretty sufficiently swamped this place up to get more grass growing in. You know, I'm having a thought right now. All you ever got to do is the next thing. <laughs> Makes things sound a little easier, doesn't it? All you ever have had to do or will ever have to do is the next thing. Like one thing at a time is not just some... Um, like idealistic saying it's how reality works and the fact that you objectively live one thing at a time with a father that knows all the number of hairs on your head should ease you Have a blessed day, everybody.